it's okay. Thank it's you. okay. I, if I knew you were going to film, I'd put on makeup. <laughs> Natural beauty. Um, you look great. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I have a home in Berkeley, California, and I, I, I read Fukuoka's book, The One Straw Revolution, Aww. a long, long time ago. And, and then I read another book I'd highly recommend called Ten Acres Enough. And mm -hmm. it's about a, 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 an accountant in New York who, in the 1860s, left. He couldn't make any, enough money to support his family. And he bought the ten worst productive acres in New Jersey and started mm -hmm. to grow food. And it talks about his journey mm -hmm. towards increasing the land. Wow. Um, and it became, I became obsessed with it. I grew up in New York City. My mom was a Holocaust survivor. The wow. idea of living in a city environment always felt unsafe to me. It always seemed like the system, the disparity in wealth between the haves and have-nots never made any sense. Being in a place where you were completely reliant on foodstuffs happening, um, you know, no, no, nothing, nothing was growing there. None of it made any sense to me. So um, I've, I've spent my life trying to figure out what made sense. And um, when I discovered Fukuoko and regenerative farming practices, I, it, I was able to look at the lens of everything we've built in our industrial economy, our consumptive economy, and it all, it all seemed very different to me, and it all seemed like it didn't make any sense. So um, I lived in Berkeley from 1990, and I've been practicing regenerative farming and an urban farm. My, I have a home in Berkeley, which is a model urban farm, um, and it's always been no fertilizers, no pesticides, no soils. Um, I've been studying everybody who's been doing this work um, mostly before 1950 is when there was a tremendous amount of regenerative farming done work and then with the introduction of mass yeah. well it's mass, mass tilling mass agriculture mass yeah. agriculture but you know it's the Haber-Bosch method which mm -hmm. is this they synthesized nitrogen in Germany and it was it was done as a as a bomb making fuel and it was mm -hmm. it, 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 and anyway it's what we're doing now is growing things that kind of look like plants that are drug addicts and um we've we've really spent the last my entire lifetime basically destroying the earth and the ecosystem and when it's interesting that the majority of the damage has really been done in about the last 56 years or thereabouts um i am really at the bottom line is i'm trying to save myself and create a place which is going to keep me safe and what I've realized is in order to do that, the best way I can keep myself safe is by creating concentric circles of healing and trying to create a global consciousness shift whereby we move away from an a economy of consumption and destruction and exploitation mm -hmm. to a new economy where we now have the tools to create a new economy based on abundance and support and regeneration and mutual understanding mm -hmm. and right now with COVID-19 and with the global economic system crumbling around us we really have a very unique opportunity to write a new narrative and to superimpose a new narrative people and I assume that's probably the main reason or one of the reasons you folks have come here is because you guys saw that there was a problem with the world you were living in and it didn't make any sense and want to contribute and be part of something better. Mm -hmm. So Zach and I are both on the same page about trying to incentivize and support and, con and contribute and support people in developing that new paradigm. Okay. So what this place is, is an institute. And it, you, you know, you could say, well, wait a second, why isn't it a productive farm? Why isn't it a, for a nonprofit? Um, why isn't it an intentional community? I've looked at all of those options and it became clear to me that if I want to create something which is going to outlive me, and it has to outlive me, it bless you, Sorry. because my business plan is 250 years long because we don't have the time in a short period of time to correct all the damage we've done. The best I feel I can do is set the intention mm. and to create an institution which has the flexibility to morph over the next 250 years and have a way that people can become vested, like in the American university system, people can become tenured professors. Mm -hmm. Because we need to superimpose a model of ownership and stewardship, differentiating that from the divisions of capitalist model, where somebody has the capital and somebody has the labor. That's a very, very new model. People have these discussions about socialism versus capitalism. There are two branches on the same tree. And what we need to do is invent a new tree 
that doesn't have anything to do with this model because every economic system that we're practicing now globally is false because they're not all inclusive because they don't include all the externalities of damaging the environment, damage mm -hmm. to the future generations, um, treating animals badly, treating people badly, breaking up communities, not supporting communities, keeping things that are ugly, not everything that's beautiful. Um, people's happiness, people's joy, people's ability to spend time with one another and love and all of this stuff. So what I believe is as a temporary model, what we have to do is understand where is the power right now. We have a global economic system which is broken. All of the power, i.e. money, is concentrated in a very, very small box. Mm. What I'm trying to do is to write a story to persuade those people who control the power that it is in their best interest to incentivize, to initiate this new narrative, to transform our current capitalist system into whatever it's going to become. Because historically, if we don't proactively transition whatever the dominant paradigm is, it implodes upon itself. Mm -hmm. There's a period of chaos. Something new arises, and it starts to smell pretty much like what the old thing you were pretty much pissed off about it is. Mm -hmm. So there's no point in destroying what we've got now, because whatever order, whatever structure we have left, we need going forward. So we need to transform what we have rather than thinking about tearing it down and breaking something new. So in order to do that, it's slowly chipping away at it. We have Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. If we all become better citizens, we will get better legislators. If we become more active, we will get better governance. But we can't expect to have better governance than we are ourselves. So to the extent to which we're masturbating on our iPhones all day long, which is what most of us are doing, we can't expect to have anything better. Given all that, what we're trying to do here is create a place where people can come and develop new forms of community, new forms of housing, new relationships with animal husbandry, ways of farming regeneratively that are going to be at, at the heart, restoring the balance to the ecosystem. And I assume if you guys are all here with Zach, you all understand this. We're talking about this. Of the cells in our body, 80% of the cells in our body are bacterial and only 20% are us. Mm -hmm. We look at the DNA, we look at most of the proteins in colostrum. Most of those proteins don't feed us, they feed the microbiome which is established mm -hmm. in the baby system. We have to understand that everything is interconnected, that everything evolves together, and that things are happening in cycles, some of which are 5 seconds, some of which are 5,000 years. When we have a plague of locusts that everybody looks at, oh, oh, that's a bad thing. In the short term, maybe it's a bad thing. But if we were smarter and we were able to get through one or two seasons of crop failure, we would look at the plague of locusts as all of a sudden an injection of energy into the entire ecosystem, which feeds everything from there going forward. That's the way nature works, and that's the way we have to look at things. At the heart of it, the most important quality we're going to need if we're going to survive is humility. Let me say that again. If we're going to survive, the most important thing we need to do is develop a posture of humility. The more we think we know the answers, the further away we're going to get from the solutions. The problems are the solutions. Humility is where it's going to be. It says it in the Bible. The meek shall inherit the earth. Adam and Eve got ejected from the Garden of Eden because they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The more we think we know, the less we come into it from a posture of service, and of mutual understanding and mutual support, the harder we have to work. The more we can step into a paradigm of abundance, everything else on the planet lives in a paradigm of abundance except for us. Mm -hmm. We create a narrative of scarcity and then we work as hard as we can to make it real. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do that. We can change that. And we have to change that now because there's very little time left. Mr. Musk, God bless him, wants to go terraform Mars. I'm more than happy to pay for his ticket. He can leave tomorrow and take all of his friends with him. But I think we'd have an easier time if we terraform this planet. We don't have the opportunity to do nature's work as well as nature has done it. We've already made too many mistakes. We've got to get down on our knees, beg forgiveness, and try to do our best to support the reestablishment of the ecosystem the way it stands, the way it wants to reestablish itself by creating opportunities so that nature can do the real heavy lifting and we can just be of service. And it's going to be the rest of my lifetime and the rest of your lifetime and the rest of our kids' lifetimes. And then maybe we'll start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But in acknowledging that and acknowledging that we're working for something that we're not going to see the light at the end of the tunnel now, we'll actually be much better off. We'll get our heads straightened out a little bit. We'll stop torturing ourselves. We'll stop hating one another. And we can all find commonality because we share 99.9% .9 of our DNA with chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. 
So when we say us versus them, it's ludicrous. <laughs> so this is a place for people to come and learn and heal. This is a place for people to try to heal themselves, the animals that are living here, the earth, the planet. Every workspace is designed primarily to be in support of the ecosystem in its entirety, entirety. Secondarily, to try to sequester carbon and to grow as much green material as possible so that we can start to pull some of the carbon dioxide out of the air. Whether or not global warming is a myth is irrelevant. We are destroying the ecosystem. It's also designed to be a place of healing and a place of education. So we're not trying to maximize production anywhere on the farm. It's more important that it be a place where work becomes euphoric. If it's not euphoric, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. If it's not euphoric, I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. People have to want to be here and want to be contributing and working. Um, it also has to be beautiful. If you look at indigenous cultures and coming from Brazil and coming from Mexico and looking at the textiles you're wearing, the fact that every car is painted primer gray and every building is gray and every wall is white and all of our clothes are the same shades, we got to get over it. We go around once. Everything has got to be beautiful. And we've got to be happy and we've got to look at the smiling faces of the people who we are pushing down and look at the fact that they have nothing and yet they're still smiling. Mm -hmm. And ask ourselves, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? And again, we have to understand that we are just one modern society, which is only a few hundred years old. And there have been many, many societies and empires that have come before us. And they, we, don't, we can't look down upon them like they were primitive people. The Egyptian architecture, that's not primitive people. Angkor Vat, that's not primitive people. The, the music of some, you know, all I'm saying is, you know, 5,000 year old Chinese culture. We got to get over ourselves. So, and look at all the wonderful things we've created, the possibility of global genocide, the destruction of the ecosystem, the fact that everything is ugly, the fact that there's no, no decent music anymore, the fact that we're all eating poison garbage. Yeah, we're great. So again, to the extent to which we can get over ourselves and come from a place of humility, maybe we've got a chance. Um, this, these two greenhouses are here to produce food, not only for this place, but to produce keiki in order to try to inspire a system of local seasonal agriculture here on Hawaii. I think we have an opportunity as the youngest landmass in the world and one that still has very strong remnants of indigenous culture and yet is tied into the United States, the great superpower, to not only save ourselves, but to act as an example first towards the United States and then to the rest of the world to try to adopt an ag a, a local regional agricultural system. We've got to reduce our energy footprint. We can't rely on green energy. It's it's a minuscule better, but not much. We've got to stop. We've got to acknowledge that everything is based on a fossil fuel paradigm, and we've got to stop wasting. Um, we've got to reduce waste. Anything that goes into the landfill is a waste. Recycling is not as good as not using it in the first place. If you're not carrying a glass water bottle or a stainless steel water bottle, think about it. Um, We've got to open our mouths and our hearts and be strong and stand up for this. And we've got to act as examples to those people who don't have the opportunity to think about these things mm -hmm. and get them to think about them even that much. 1% change is a whole lot better than nothing. Um, we've got to build new forms of community and find out how we can interact with each other and acknowledge that we do need each other. We've got to acknowledge that we share the planet with everything and that the animals are all here. And I, I hope that for those of you who want to spend some time walking around, You'll see all of the animals are running free and they all want to be our friends. Mm -hmm. And we've, we've superimposed this narrative of domination. And I think it's out of guilt um, that we don't feel like we can eat something that we can first love. Mm -hmm. I think we'd all be a lot better off if we learn how to love the animals that we're consuming and understand that mm -hmm. in order to maintain a balance, I don't, I'm not sure a vegan or a vegetarian diet at this point is necessary. I do think maybe we want to think about eating adult males and letting the female animals help us in, in terms of a regenerative process but that's a choice you can you need to make for yourself i think that we need to get people on board as quickly as possible and the choice that i've made is not to oh, even though for the most part i'm vegetarian i don't want to preach vegetarianism because people need to get on the wagon and, it, and and i need to get people who want to eat meat on the wagon and if i can get them to eat meat consciously and acknowledge that they don't want to eat something that's been poisoned and tortured mm -hmm and limit their meat to those animals which they've been mainly raised and actually partake of raising an animal 
and killing an animal mm -hmm. and giving gratitude for the animal and then consuming the animal, I think that's, if I can get that done, I'll be happy. Um, we all need to get off our fat asses and work. <laughs> we all need to get our hands dirty. We all need to develop some calluses. We got too many people with soft asses and soft bellies and soft palms. <laughs> um, we have the opportunity now because of these amazing devices to both learn and use our minds and our hands at the same time. There are Bluetooth speakers everywhere. I'm working all day long and there's not a minute in the day that I'm not listening to a lecture or trying to study something or at least listening to Aretha Franklin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Amen. So, um, yeah, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, so be, be mindful. And, you know, if we're up all night playing music or doing whatever it is, take some time at night to shut off everything and be quiet and listen to everything. Because aside from polluting the earth with plastic, we're polluting the, the earth with electromagnetic energy and we're polluting the earth with noise. And if you can listen to the songs of the night, and you can listen to how all the animals share the space, and you can listen to the multiple conversations and symphonies. And I'm a musician, and I feel guilty playing since I've been here because the world can be a very beautiful place, and there's so much music in the world without us contributing the noise that we're contributing. Um, it's just being more mindful. And I promise you that as you become more mindful, and I can see that you people are here because you're already very far along on the journey or you wouldn't be here to begin with. Mm -hmm. But try to be strong enough to assume the responsibility of the fact that you are already on the journey and, and, and shepherd other people on the journey and acknowledge you've got to meet them where they are and it's going to be frustrating. You know how you know the pioneers? We're the ones with the arrows in our backs. And that's where we are right now. And we've got to acknowledge we're going to take a few arrows at this point in the journey. Um, I think I've said way too much. I'm going to say a little bit more about the greenhouses. We have a working aquaculture system in place. There are fish ponds. It's a gravity feed. It's a zero moving parts aquaculture system. So all of the water out of the hoses is pre-fertilized from the fish pond. There's no soil being brought in anywhere on the farm. There's no chemicals. There's no fertilizers. There's no pesticides. We're not fighting against anything. We're trying to support those things we want to support. At the heart of everything is how are we supporting the ecosystem? We're working in conjunction with our animals and green manures and animal manures. We're acknowledging the need to support the mycorrhizal system and the fungal system where we're growing mushrooms and we're trying to introduce um, other forms of mycorrhiza in order to build that. Uh, walk around, talk to Rodolph. Um, I'm gonna probably take a walk through the food fields. Um, if anybody wants to come with me and ask questions, if anybody is done hearing my voice, I don't blame you for one second. Um, walk around the farm. We can make a new plan you want to make. I'm going to follow you. Mm -hmm. okay. I like that idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
So this project started about a year and a half ago, and I had a great guy who smoked too much dope and lost his shit, and he left it all, and then all of a sudden I found David, and David was the guy I was looking for, and David just took over. So we're about a year behind schedule, um, but you know, it's it's dealing with disappointments. It's only, only, yeah. <laughs> um, what is that growing in you? There's several different. It's um, there's seeds which he's he's sterilized and steamed, um, mm -hmm. regular like millet seeds, and we're also using um, uh, pellets from a pellet stove. Mm. Um, and I think we're we're gonna try whole oats, and we're gonna chip up some guava and try to use that. Oh, yeah. I guess the, the 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 basics is he's sterilizing all of the medium first to get all of the other fungi and everything out of it, mm -hmm. and then he's inoculating it. So we bought on Amazon about twelve different varieties of mushroom inoculates, and mm -hmm. first we cultivated those on little um, wooden dowels. And it's just like it's multiplying. It's called taking a little spore and then making more. And those jars are going to get. And after those jars are all inoculated, mm. then they're going to go into feed bags. We're going to try to use these feed bags for everything. Mm. Um, and if you guys don't have enough animals that you need feed bags, I can I can send you home with. <laughs> I'm looking I'm looking to have people use those either as pots. Got a lot. Yeah, we got a lot. So yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, try you know anything we can keep out of the landfill is a success. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. How is he sterilizing the, the meat? No. Is it like uh, he just boils it? There was isopropyl alcohol in there. I don't, he's got two uh, rocket stoves he made and he's got a pressure cooker. Mm. So like auto mm. it's essentially auto yeah. it. Yeah. Look at you in your terms. <laughs> is combine goats and chickens in the same area because they're symbiotic and what happens is it breaks the parasite cycle when you have the more species you have the more it breaks the parasite cycle so we're not doing any anti-parasites here and I don't really I've got a couple of goats that perhaps have parasite loads but it's a, a couple of sheep not a couple of goats but aside from that we're not doing any anti-parasites and I mean I, I can't bring myself with everything else we're doing to be regularly warming these animals. Just, oh, I, so I can't I can't justify yeah, it. Okay. I can't justify it. So to be regularly what? Warming and warming. Oh, okay. I gotta say that you know we all have parasites. Yeah. And I think if, if I mean people say that eating papaya seeds is an anti-parasitic, but I just to do the industrial chemical pharmaceutical stuff can't bring myself to do it. Okay. Yeah. So, so far, I don't feel like. Oh no! Somebody just made a baby. Baby. Oh my god! Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, there's two species here. There's two four goats, five goats in here, and then I let them all out, and then all the goats are turning. <laughs> are in one goat herd right now and they're up at the other side and they all travel free. Um, I've got sheep that are about to lamb and I think what I'm going to try to do is get the female sheep in here to protect them over the first couple of weeks. Um, but it's, I'm not trying to introduce a, a paradigm of confinement because we have to talk about rotational grazing and using the animals as grazers to continually improve the land. So anytime you're Introducing a paradigm where you're 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 keeping an animal in some type of confinement, you're creating some problems for yourself mm -hmm. that then you have to solve. Mm -hmm. So none of these systems are fully developed, and I'm trying to understand how to work with the animals in a way that the environment is benefited the most, even if it's a little bit more work. I think the animals learn to trust you, and they'll come in and out if they're not felt like they can't get out when they want to come out. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but you know, just just trying to figure it out little by little. Mm. Gary, do you mind if I pick up a chicken? No. Thank you. Don't bite its head off, right? Some guy did that the other thing. Yeah, I'll make some chicken stew. Okay. Um, so yeah, we're um, 
let's 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 keep going this way. And there's this is a little shop. Well, it was originally we were gonna do goat milking in there and milking. We can move that tomorrow, yeah. Feed stack. Where yeah, it's it, the thing about it is is very little of what's happening here is my direction. I'm talking to people who are coming here and I'm trying to give people the opportunity to try things and make mistakes because nice. I think that people off site are coming here as partnerships kind of Well, I've had interns come and go and people come and I really want to give people the opportunity because I think that when you talk about what is a strong man and a strong leader, I don't think you can really become strong unless you've had the opportunity to try and fail and overcome those failures. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things our society and our economic system doesn't provide for is the value of failure. Uh, so very little of what you see here is actually my vision. It's more my trying to take a support role so that other people can develop and develop their vision so that they can ultimately go out there and be... There's what Rodolfo is saying. He's a people from my side that no experience in planting. He's just... Saying, yeah, yeah. Doing <laughs> yeah, and you know, it's like I, I, I constantly give him tasks and say, okay, this is what I would do, now go do it. Mm -hmm. And if you fuck up, talk to me. But if you haven't fucked up, then you really probably haven't learned enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, what we've done is we've We've cordoned off the fields where we're growing food to create a permaculture garden. We've cordoned them off to keep the large animals out. Um, so I let the horses in here the other day, and it was a mistake. And the horses ate some of the plants. But every one of these, this, we've got four, <laughs> four food fields, three of which are approximately three quarters of an acre, one of which is three acres. And we've terraced these. Um, another another guy you guys should check out. There are two Australian guys who are amazing. Peter Andrews and Walter Jenna. And they're the guys who are talking about managing water flow mm -hmm. and slowing down water and keeping water on the land. So check those guys out if you haven't. Walter, Walter Jenna, J-E-H-N-N-E, -N -N -E, I think is the way he spells his name. Um, and he hasn't written a book, but he's got a, treat, a treatise which is available online. And if you have problems finding it, let me know and I'll forward it to you. Um, so what we did was we brought in mulch from the city and we created these terraces, working with the topography of the land, and then we inoculated it with mulch that we got from the Humacool Mushroom Factory to introduce mycorrhizal strains. And then we brought in, I've got the super hookup with the Hilo Fish Company, so I bring in about three tons of fish waste um, every week. Um, it's a hugely beneficial product, which I'm only scratching the surface in terms of its utility. Mm -hmm. um, and if you guys know of anybody who is interested in exploring uh, black soldier fly or mealworms, I mean, that's, you know, along with mushrooms, insect cultivation as a protein source is another mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. crucial you know, component. Black soldier flies I haven't had a whole lot of success, but that seems like a really good one. Really would be into that. Is that fish what fish residue? Well, every fish that's harvested, 60% of every fish gets wasted. Yeah. Mm. So if every 100 pounds of fish, 60 mm. pounds gets discarded. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. horrendous. Mm -hmm. What we really need to do now, pray God, is mm -hmm. that the whole world stop fishing for two years. Mm -hmm. The oceans are empty. The oceans are empty. The, the destruction of the oceans to this point, compared to what they were, I mean, if you really could understand it, you had no choice but to get down on your knees and cry. That, that's how much damage we've done. Anyway, the fish, for right now, I've got the hookup for the fish waste. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing it here right now. It serves to feed the wild boar. I'm feeding about 100 wild boar that are a, a food source. Mm -hmm. All of the birds here, the wild birds, the insects, and it also acts as a fertilizer for the plants. And the bones degrade and act as a long-term source of calcium. So if you look under here, as an example, this is a, we don't have very many compost piles, but this is what happens after the bones are left. <clears throat> so this is going to decompose down, and this is going to be some super, super plant food, which we're then going to incorporate into everything. And how are you dealing with the smell? 
I, I, uh, I have learned to adopt. The smell is when I bring this, I usually go on like Wednesdays and Saturdays to pick up fish. And depending on the weather, um, two days afterwards, and I try to spread it around. You it's, do that in your truck? I do it in my truck. Dude, oh I do all this myself. God. Oh my God. Yeah. We do that with the algae. I mean, yeah, we just did with the invasive algae from the hotels, and man, that was intense. Yeah, it's intense. Like people were flipping me off on the way home. Well, I they, well, I've got it so that I go to the fish company. They have they put it in in sixty five gallon barrels. They keep it in the freezer. Mm. I run there. They load the barrels into the back of my truck, and I run straight home and dump them. So by the you just dump them out in piles. Yeah, and and right now it's in piles, and I'm trying to take certain. I'm trying to be selective, like I'm trying to feed some of the fish to the captive birds and bring them some fish so they can eat it and then trying to spread it out. But if I had it's more quick. manpower, you gotta, go, you gotta be fast though. You gotta be fast. And <laughs> we break it down with sugar. That's, or fomic acid is and great. And it doesn't smell at all. It smells great actually. It smells like fish sauce kind of. I would love, if you know of anybody, if, if I had more manpower here, I would, I would do that. And I had a guy who was doing it and then he went and split and did his own thing. Yeah, I saw those bones, it was really cool. I was like, what the hell? How long will it take the bones to compost? You know, I don't know. Yeah. This was a new experiment. This is, this, these, these piles were all put out here within the last few days. Okay. Um, I had them all, and I had two volunteers come, and without my saying anything, they decided to do this, mm -hmm. and I came out one afternoon, and all this was just done. Oh, cool. Oh. I thought it was for fire. <laughs> I think fire. people want to contribute. You know, we've divided our economy between work to make money and then work to live. And I think we've got to get over ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we've got to come up with a new definition of work, which combines the idea that there's a non-profit world, which does good things, and a for-profit world, which does bad things. It's, it's insanity. <laughs> so, I mean, I work seven days a week from the moment I get up to the moment I go to bed. I don't make any money. And somehow I've stepped onto this surfing wave of abundance. Mm -hmm. And people bring me steaks, or people bring me guava juice, or people bring me bags of pacololo, mm -hmm. or people bring me goat cheese, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's a mental state. I think if, if once you trust that the world is a place of abundance, mm -hmm. it becomes that. You the can manifest that. Yeah, one of my favorite Einstein quotes is, uh, the most important decision you make is, Believing whether the universe is a friendly or a hostile, or you living in it, you are living in a friendly or a hostile universe. Love it. I love it. You know, Ernst talks about making your enemy your ally. How, how do you? What do you? How do you feel about the strawberry guapa? How do you deal with that? Um, it's the problem is the solution. Um, you know, I, I have a the biggest weed whacker they make with a, a big blade, and my meditation is I fill up the gas tank. I try to do it once a day, and I put on. I put on ear, a mask and ear and eye, and I go out here and I pull the trigger to full blast and I don't take my finger off the trigger until the gas tank is empty. <laughs> and I'm back and forth like a side. And that's, that's my exercise, that's my meditation. And you know, um, I can use, it's, it's, it's. And then use it for biomass. All of this here, I mean, this is all, this was me doing, this was all weeds up to here, this entire field two weeks ago was weeds up to here, and this is just me in this field in the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. And how much, how much rain are you getting over here? You know, I don't know anymore because the, the lava flow or something changed weather patterns. What it used to be? 170. Wow. Yeah. Can you grow stuff without a, without a tarp cover? I mean, can you grow vegetables and stuff without... We're, we're trying. I mean, we're, we're trying. We're, we're experimenting with everything. I just planted a whole... I mean, I, I, go, I go to the market and I buy every variety of organic potato and yam and sweet potato I can get. And we try to sprout everything. And if, if, if there's local Hawaiian corn that's non-GMO, I try to dry it and plant that. Um, you know, again, it's creating opportunity. And even if it doesn't grow now, if we can... You know, we need to be sharing genetic material. We need to, I need to be giving you stuff and you need to be bringing me stuff because maybe something that'll grow in your side that won't grow here and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And we've got to give nature the opportunity to really do what it wants to do. And I think the best thing we can do is come from a place of humility and give nature the opportunity to do what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, that's a lot of rain. 
<laughs> and you think it's more now? Less. Less. Much less. And the weather is not this. We never had weather like We're this. We're getting way more. Way more water. Like more than we would like to do. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I think plant, plant ground cover. I mean, you know, bare dirt, bare dirt is bad. Plant anything that'll take. We oh, no, not, we don't have any bare dirt. Uh, yeah. We're not feeding any of the birds. We're not taking it. No, it's all seed. Everybody eats seed. Seed that's viable. Bird seed, every kind of bird seed I can get. That's what it is. Chickens eat it, ducks eat it, goats eat it. Everybody eats bird seed. Pigs eat it. Because mm. it goes in one end, and if it doesn't mm -hmm. turn into energy, it comes out the other end and turns into biomass. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, how are you investing your money as an annuity? And, and if you're buying processed GMO corn chicken feed. So the, the bird feed overall is, is then cheaper and it's, it's better? I know that when I've, I have, I, people appreciate the work I'm doing here. So a lot of people have are giving me discounts on stuff like, you know, expired this or expired that. And I know when people are giving me a pallet of processed layer pellets or whatever it is, the birds complain, they're not into it, the eggs start getting this form, there are fewer eggs, and the color of the yolks goes from orange to yellow. And then these little homes are for birds? No, I had a guy here who came who was a super creative chef, <laughs> and he decided this was what he wanted to live in, and he built this for himself, and he was Amazing. camping in it. Oh, wow. Now he's that boy. Oh yeah, man. He was in here with his little tent. And you buy them? Do you buy them the wood? I I get pallets. I get I buy lumber by the pallet and just have construction materials available to do what I want to do. Oh, okay. yeah. Because <laughs> there's no. If I want to do it, I don't want to go make yeah, a yeah, cut yeah. list and go yeah. shopping. It's, it's like. Awesome. Exactly. You know, give me 20 foot two by sixes, yeah. give me 20 foot two by fours, and I'll figure it out. Is that is a chicken house? This is, this is in there? Yeah, that's a chicken house. That's, yeah, you want to go say hi? But there's more. <laughs> yeah, that's the chicken house. Yeah, that's the chicken house. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she was. Nick. Yeah, she she was just a dog that somebody didn't want. Hey, Gary, do you have any ducks? I do. Okay. She's probably a duck being born right now. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to take a duck that's about to be born home with you and raise it. Oh, well, I wanted to, but I'm tired. Maybe I'm the low, Gary. Sebastian. Yeah. My Yumi would kill me. So all these chickens were born here. So we've got an incubator, and we're just incubating chickens. And the idea is that we want to be able to encourage people to come and learn about raising chickens because they're integral to what's going on. And then hopefully once we can formalize some classes in chicken raising and building chicken coops, we can send people home with chicken flocks. And we're all doing poi chickens, so it's a whole bunch of different genetic material that's being introduced, some wild varieties, some different varieties. And I'm selectively taking eggs that are just bigger and I'm incubating the eggs that are mm. bigger with the hopes that we're kind of focusing on breeding chickens that have bigger eggs. Mm. Like the three eggs. <clears throat> you know, I don't know. Um, people, I, I, I've had roosters that are a couple of days old that I can tell already mm. just by their attitude. It's like, dude, come on, give me a break. <laughs> and, um, Get over yourself. <laughs> You know, maybe I'm Brazilian at heart, but the sex is not that important to me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, whatever they are, what they are. And I just, I don't, we have a lot of, there's probably 50 roosters here. Oh, wow. And, um. Yeah, we just, <laughs> why is there a lot of work for people deal with? <laughs> people are sensitive to noise. Oh, it's noisy here at night. It is noisy. We have a big space, too. It's noisy here. No, it's noisy. It's noisy. It's very noisy. And do you, do you eat these birds? We, we created a chicken processing facility because uh, for the whole community, we, we laid it out and um, I have eaten a couple of them. Again, I'm not, I, for me, I'm happy with goat cheese and eggs yeah, yeah. and honey. I'm really, I mean, that's a diet. Well, you're not doing meat birds, but uh, No, we're not here. doing meat varieties here, but we, we, I would be nice to do mixed birds and I do want to get some people who have meat varieties and incorporate those genetics so that we can get 
but again, now I think it's I a matter of dual purpose, right? Like yeah, hard rocks. And... Yeah, but I'm I'm not I'm not that organized, and I don't have the time to be that anal. Right? So I kind of just like raising things, and I'm like, you know, I don't want to do those things. Yeah, that was the last thing. This is all B, right? Yeah, you make it soup. Or I mean, small. soup or stew or. Eat small, maybe it's better. I don't know. I mean, I I think that eating local seasonal stew, we need to get away from annual grains and go towards root vegetables of tubers like potatoes, sweet potatoes. Every time we plant soy or wheat or corn, it's destroying. You you have to necessarily because you're planting it annually. You've got to destroy the ecosystem in order to grow it. So what we if we if we start adopting a diet which is focused on optimal planetary health, I really believe that that diet is also provides optimal human health. And to be able to, you can, you can make stew out of greens and tubers and root vegetables and a little bit of meat, yeah. and you can feed a lot of people and some, uh, really well, healthfully, super efficiently. And it's a kind of a meal, if you serve people a big bowl of stew, it's a meal which brings people together as opposed to your big mac and french fries, mm -hmm. which creates... Or chicken wings. Or chicken wings, which <laughs> creates borders necessarily. So I think we really, in terms of building communities, supporting the ecosystem, I think we can address all of these problems simultaneously. And to the extent to which we do, I think the solutions become easier and, and, and simpler. So what was your point regarding like how uh, optimum, like planetary health um, also aligns with the optimal human health regarding food. Um, how, do, how do those align? I think that right now we have an, an epidemic of malnutrition, diabetes, and heart coronary disease, all of which are very new diseases, and they're all coincident with a diet which is based on a cereal grains and legumes, which are farmed using huge amounts of fossil fuel inputs mm -hmm. at every level of production. It's killing the planet, and it's also killing us. Mm -hmm. We need to reintroduce much more variety into our diet, and by switching to a diet which is more beneficial to long-term planetary health, as an example, potatoes and sweet potatoes and yams and ulu, as opposed to corn, barley, wheat, right. rye, okay. and if we go to fresh <laughs> leafy vegetables in season, and we go to a small component of humanely grass-fed, pasture-raised meat, mm -hmm. and we eat local seasonal stews, depending on what's available on an ongoing basis, I believe that not only are we optimizing planetary health, but we're also we're also promoting a diet which is optimizing human health. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, there, Thanks. Are there any uh, cereals or grains or legumes that aren't kind of like in that? Like, like pigeon pea comes to mind. Like, I know that. Yeah, there are lots. I think it's a question of how you grow them, but if you're talking about growing soy as we grow it mm -hmm. as a cattle feed okay. and as a starch and as i mean it, we're growing the fact that we're growing millions of acres of soy using nothing but chemicals i mean it's genocide mm -hmm. it's genocide absolutely okay. there's no other way to describe it yeah yeah are uh, chickens eating the weed on it or are you support the family so here's what my chickens and my factory chickens are eating so right now until i can get somebody to help me raise so there's mealworms. Mm. So these I buy on a regular basis. I'm not happy about this. It's a compromise. Mm. Okay, but it's a protein source. Mm. And and there's the bird seed. And you get better luck with this than a um, a an organic flower pellet, a layer pellet. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you get chickens, do A B no, comparisons. Yeah, 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 do A B comparisons and see see what they go for. Put 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 two piles out, see what see what they want to eat. The birds will be most beneficial. I try to use old seeds to do that, but for feeding day they need a lot. You need a lot. And they sell in Disney stores. I, I buy pa I buy pallets mm -hmm. at a time. I buy a pallet of like fifty pound bags. Yeah, we're not happy with the, the way we... I mean, when we were doing uh, pigs, a lot of pigs, we were doing a lot of... Um, we were making fodder out of um, whole barley. Mm -hmm. And I felt really good about the nutrition I was getting, but I hated buying all that whole barley. And it was a nightmare. It was a ton of work, you know, sterilize all that and spout them in six day, six day mats. We're doing fodder trays and each of the chickens, these are fodder trays. Uh -huh. And the chickens get the fodder trays. So yeah. we are doing a fodder tray system. Yep. And I agree with you. 
I think it's crucial and we're finding, we're experimenting with different grains and different amounts of medium and no medium. Yeah. And I, again, I think it's a compromise, but you know, right here is an example. So here's the annuity. So, what, what are these yellow guavas? These are, these yellow are, strawberry those strawberry. are the strawberry guavas. Well, how come those ones are yellow? I don't know. Yes, I've never seen the yellow variety. They're, and, aren't and they actually, great? They're better. Oh yeah, they're great. So this is the seed. So this is the seed that has passed through the animal's stomach and is now regenerating. So over time, this will become a self-sustaining... This, this is a millet. Millet, yeah. millet. millet. This is a millet. So you're hoping to, to be generating your own seed. And you can do that with 170 inches of rain? You can still get... I don't know. I don't know anything. I'm just throwing shit at the wall seeing what sticks. Yeah. yeah. After the incubator, and this is this is stage three for them. They're now getting released into the big world. And Christine and Mina took all the chickens and then they go into this the the full room and got them out of here. And now these guys will stay in here for the next month and a half. I've been incubated. I'll show you. These are horse mats, yeah. These are horse mats. They're way to the do naturally. <laughs> I think it's 20 more days for chickens, okay. one way or another. What's that? Yeah. Now the things about the way they're out, and a lot of times they won't, they won't stick. And they're like, they're just after the well, that's why we're taking them right away, because even if they do get born here in the wild, the majority of them... The Mogus gets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, oh, okay. No, wait, wait. Yeah. 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 I'll show you this. Yeah. 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 But the mom doesn't yeah. stay with that. So you put the egg in the incubator. I put the egg in the incubator, no mom, and then I raise them like in the kibbutz mom. Like, so I raise all the kids together. And I hand raise them, and I, I, I take the young ones and I put one older one in so it teaches them a little bit and then when new ones are born I take one young one. Hey, have you seen the dots? It's still happening but I think it has to do with the economics. I think that as people's expectations for material stuff goes, they're, they're lured into, uh, into what we're doing now. And they teach us. If we have an economic downturn, so we have a, people will be forced into changing their expectations. I think we're there. I think we are there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we are there. And the reason that I'm, I want to function this as a school is because I think most people, it's, it's a much more easily governable model than intentional communities. 99% of the intentional communities fail. And people don't really want to do that. Very, very, very bad This is Leia, Princess Leia. Oh, mm. And where's Benji? Benji was my other boy. The little black and white one? No, the black one was Sebastian. Um, and he named Artax? Artax. Artax? Artax, I don't know. Where's, what's Artax? Where's Artax? Um, Never Ending Story. Oh, Artax. Okay, I'm always looking for good names. Never Ending Story. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that part of the family is like no, I'll show you her mom. She's, yeah. I'll show you her mom and her dad. She's just a punk. Yeah. <laughs> she's just a punk. She's just, she's just a puppy dog. She's, a, she's been like that since she was born. She's been like a big puppy dog. Yeah. She's kind of all crippled up. That's yeah. her dad. And the horse, the brown horse with the white blaze who's got her, mm. he's eating, that's yeah. her mom. Aw, just like her mom. <laughs> the socks and the blaze. Good. Okay. Great cheese. I don't, I want to make cheese, I want, but I don't have enough help. I need more, I need people, I need people want to make cheese and I, I've got bees and we're, we get the best honey and I want somebody, we want to expand this bees. Woman, she's just to Italy, she's the best, she makes the best <laughs> cheese I've ever had. She's so good. Yeah, and she yeah. makes sourdough bread, she's yeah. very talented. But she's hey. in Italy. Well, only because she's sick of what's going on can here. Put, put down, we can put her back inside there. Okay. And, and, and we uh, can feel where she was. Yeah. Turkeys. Huh? Maybe try to get a workshop for her so she can teach. If she's going to do it, let me know. I'll try to come. I'll try to take some time off and, and actually get off the phone for one day. Hey, Gary, by the way, is it cool? I was using these bags uh, for like cuttings. Is it cool if I take some along the way? Take anything you want. Cool, thank you. 
I forgot that as we were walking through. But, uh, <laughs> I got some sweet potato, uh, different variety. Oh, this guy's dangerous, right? No? It's, it's a bad thing. It means they got too much protein when they were young. It's called angel wing. It's it's considered a. Uh, There's a fat fat geese. Yeah, and so they were a rescue as well. So here's tilapia, koi, mosquito fish. This pipe starts here and it goes through there, goes all the way down to the greenhouses, and all the water in the greenhouses comes pre-fertilized from this fish pond. That like a siphon, you know, like when you siphon gas, you steal gasoline from your neighbor's car. Right. <laughs> Every Saturday. Yep. Every Saturday. <laughs> you gotta switch goes. up the days so they don't know when you're coming. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's a siphon, and the siphon breaks every once in a while. Something happens and the siphon breaks. That up again. So it. there's a, a hose bib right there, and then there's a hose bib right there. That's the highest point. So I run this hose from the house under pressure into that hose line. And then I crack that one, and I just stand there. It takes me about an hour to believe the system. So there's hose, there's pressure coming in from the house, and then that pushes it through the other line? Right, but the air bubbles in the line, when you're doing a siphon, the air bubbles will stick to the pipe. Okay. So you've got to be really patient. So the, it takes sometimes it takes the air bubbles. This is 700 feet, so yeah. it really takes an hour okay. of cracking it, pressurizing it, letting the air bubbles creep up the line, cracking it releasing it okay. and you just have to be patient and then you have to believe the system and wait until you're getting pressure out without any gas release and then you know that the siphon has been complete nice. close everything off and, and then you've got pressure is the high point your property up here uh <laughs> no there's a the high point you remember for me point. and then we'll try to write it down right now so that's a long <laughs> Uh, this pond, I've got five ponds. This one was here when I bought the place. Oh, wow. And that liner was here. That's a 30 year old liner. And still no leaks or anything? This is the only one that leaks. And this is the only one with the liner. And yeah, this is the I, only I, one. The only reason I've never done this, I just like everyone's trying to sell on the liner pond. I'm like, is that like a 15 year warranty? Most of the same. I tell you, do what I do with the pigs and the grain, and it doesn't leak. None of the other ponds leak. That's the mucking process? I just go out there after we dug out the pond, take a big bag of grain and just spread it out super, super thin. Yeah. And then nightfall comes, the pigs come and they'll get every grain of grain out of there yeah. and they'll trample it down. Then do it again, twice. Uh -huh. And now you got a waterproof pond. Wow. Just Dude, twice? That's amazing. Yeah, I, think, I don't think I've done any of these ponds more than three times. You would need, you'd need a bed of mud there, yeah, a bed of dirt. You can't have too much rock, yeah, it's not gonna... They've gotta have the material to work with. They've gotta have some material. You don't have big rocks in the soil here? Oh yeah, I mean, this is all... I mean, you, but we, we dug it up with a tractor first. We dug it up with a skid steer. Did we you put, to lay we, more material back in there? No, we no. just pushed it around with a skid steer. Okay, mm -hmm. and then you got enough of there that they went in there and trampled that. Yeah, but I mean, this place... We've got soil, more soil here than most people. And then how about the sides as it comes up? I go up there with grass. You can't plant grain seeds, so I've gone up there in the middle of the night in the rain myself, night after night after night. And seed, keep putting it where you want them. Put seed, no, right. seeding the banks so that the roots take hold, and that's what holds the berms. Mm. Just awesome. me at night in the rain with mm. seeding. <laughs> wow. How long have you been here? I bought yeah. this place 17 years ago, and I moved here from California full time not quite three years ago. Wow. Nice. Yeah. And the way you design buildings and the way you place buildings direct how people act with each other. So Why is the name of the book again? A Pattern Language. Um, and um, another one to add to that is a guy named David Kennedy, and he wrote a book called House, mm. which also talks about architecture and how it affects people and the way they, they interact. Okay. Um, but um, so what I, the question I asked for myself is, okay, how do you create a village where you have give people enough private space mm -hmm. so that they can have some privacy without having a sense of ownership mm -hmm. 
and how do you promote a sense of stewardship? So this was the first experiment, and there's a lot of things I got wrong here, um, but I thought, okay, each one of these houses has its own shower, um, because I, I think, I mean, for me, I don't give a shit, but I think communal showers, especially for women, it can get weird. Um, so each one of these has its own kitchen and its own shower, but there's two toilets and a washing machine that's shared by the four cabins, and there was a lot of thought that went into how the cabins were oriented from one another and the square footage and where they were. So this is kind of a pod. This is four cabins. I think ideally I would do the next one with three because three I think is a good number to force people to arrive at compromise as opposed to um, creating groupies. Grouping up. Mm. It's easy to clean out the towels mm. and I try to use anything that's plastic would otherwise go in the Waste bin, right? And for these guys, I'm feeding these starter pellets yep. and, um, and and mealworms, and I give them uh, brewer's yeast and a little bit of apple cider vinegar in the water as a probiotic. You ever try the Korean mm -hmm. apple farming one, the rice and bamboo leaf? Um, I think it's it's very well. I think that. Um, <coughs> you know. Isn't there one called like the One Seed Revolution? The, the One Straw Revolution. One That's one Fukuoka. I mean, if you don't know Temple Grandin's work, you got to know oh, Temple. Oh, I love Temple Grandin. Do you have a copy of this in your library? Okay, now you do. I love that you oh my God, copies. Thank you so much. Have you read The Garden Awakening yet? By Mary Reynolds right there. Just no, to... I just, it, I, I'm a crazy person. I like, I read shit I'm and the then, same. and like, I have my phone on Amazon. Yeah. And they recommend just books buy it. and I just yeah. buy it. Because it's a library and yeah, I buy, too. I'm buying multiple it. copies so that I can give you I think you I bought one. it too. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> My favorite mindfulness book. I've bought it like seven times, and I just keep giving it away. Yeah. <laughs> mm. But you know, you need um, some Charles Eisenstein in here. You know, Newman Turner was a, a, a British guy in the '40s, and Newman Turner had a lot to say. Um, you know, the so I mean, Sir Albert Howard. You have to know about Sir Albert Howard. I mean, he's the indoor method. But, you know, this is, this is, Sir Albert Howard is something pretty interesting because it's something you guys should know in terms of the history of the movement. So people say, what do you do as far as your compost pile goes? And I say, I don't have a compost pile. And the concept of a compost pile was something that was originated by Sir Albert Howard in Indore, India. What's called the Indore Project. And what he was going to India to do was not to deal with fertility issues, but he was going to deal with parasite issues. And everybody was shitting all over the place. And what he discovered was by building these piles and using green manures to build piles, they would naturally heat up to 160 plus degrees and inoculate and, inoculate and kill all the parasites. So my feeling is that every aspect of the decomposition process from the conversion of something from solar energy to something we call life, every component, every part of that cycle is imperative. And to the extent to which there are different organisms that live in each phase of that process of decomposition and when we accelerate that we're weakening the entire system because we're going past certain portions of that of that cycle which are crucial to the overall system health so i tell people my compost pile is in the stomachs of my animals nice so Food scraps are of more value served to animals because they come out the other end as compost already. Yeah. And like when, you, when you heat up something and you accelerate the process, the byproduct is methane, which is a greenhouse gas. So my only compost pile to that extent is in my methane digester. Um, and I'm trying to explore, experiment with that. Mm. But just something to think about. But Sir Albert Howard is another you know, guy from the 40s to check out. Um, it, the book that you guys really have to read, and I'm, kind of, I, I'm going to go grab it from my bed because I just, it's just the most beautiful book, and everybody should read it just because it's, it's so beautiful. And I don't want to misquote it, but everybody should read it. Don't film this picture, man. I haven't read this. Everybody should read this. I mean, this is this is about the most beautiful writing you're ever going to see, and it really points out how much we've lost. And it's just it's inspiring and heartbreaking at the same time. Nice. Thank you. Thank you.